Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson, and we're back with part two of my conversation with Dr. Mohammed Khalil. Hopefully, uh, you've already listened to the first part. If you haven't, press pause, go back and listen to the first part, and then come back here. If you've already listened to the first part, then welcome to part two. Uh, hopefully, this has been an educational conversation for you. I had a great time recording this uh, conversation with uh, Dr. Khalil, and i um, and really learned a lot myself uh, throughout the process. So, uh, until we, uh, before we rash yet, welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson, and we're back with part two of my conversation with Dr. Muhammad Khalil, uh, professor of religious studies and director of the Muslim Studies Program and adjunct professor in the College of Law at Michigan State University. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the first part. If you haven't listened to it yet, press pause, go back and listen to that part first, and then come back and listen to this part. Uh, if you've already listened to the first part, then welcome to part two. Uh, before we get into it, uh, don't forget if you enjoy what we're doing here to give us a nice five-star rating review and share with a friend. Uh, again, as a independent podcast, it's, it's tough for us to get out there. So it, that helps us get in front of new listeners. Also, for all things deconstructionist, check out our website at www. Did I give enough W's there? There's three W's. You guys know this. Uh, the deconstructionist.com uh, for links to our social media, blog, web store, Patreon, and our entire back catalog of episodes that you can stream for free from the website. Uh, so, welcome back to part two. Uh, this will conclude our two episode series with Dr. Khalil, and then we'll be back next week with an all new guest. But until then, enjoy. And without further ado, here is part two with Dr. Muhammad Khalil. This is not to deny the role of religion in what happened on 9-11. Bin Laden, I believe, did believe in religion, did believe in a particular interpretation of Islam. I believe that. What I would also say, though, is that it was not the Islam, the historical Islam, or the prevailing you know, interpretation or understanding of Islam today. Uh, it was a kind of aberrant, strange Islam predicated on well, just to give the, like the example I mentioned earlier, misinformation, um, you know, twisting of the sources. So there, there is a religious component. It's just not a, re- a a religion that's representative of the vast majority of Muslims. That's a that's a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> that, and that's fascinating too. The, the the fact that there is a distinction between um, you know their religious beliefs, the, the folks who support it, uh, distinction between their religious beliefs and and sort of their personal political beliefs that it, it was more, you know, the, the folks who supported it were more uh, inclined to lean into the sort of the political socioeconomic, uh, their, you know, the beliefs there versus mm-hmm. what they actually believe from a religious standpoint. So that's, that's right. That's really and, and actually I have a, a, a Christian friend who taught in Indonesia hmm. for a few years after nine 11. And he, and I remember he mentioned that even some of the Indonesian Christians that he knew, would justify 9-11 for political reasons. So, um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I think this is, this is important to keep in mind is that, yes, bin Laden claimed to have been motivated by religion, but also when you look at the response and the people who, are accept, who accept what happened, sometimes it's more because of anti-American sentiments uh, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and po- political reasons rather than, let's say, their reading of the Quran. Yeah, that's, re- that's really interesting. Um, I, I definitely, I think this is an interesting thread to, to, to continue, to continue going mm-hmm. down. But before we do that, I think it's probably important also to note that, um, I, I'm, I'm sure this is the case with, uh, with Islam as it is with Christianity. We have obviously thou- tens of thousands, at least in North America, uh, different, uh, sort of interpretations of Christianity. We have over, I think last, uh, I looked, it was like 45, 48,000 different, uh, denominations, meaning variations of the interpretation of what Christianity should be. Um, I'm assuming that it's similar within uh, Islam as well. There's probably different interpretations and in, in schools of thought as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, sometimes I'll tell my students, maybe facetiously, that if there are 2 billion Muslims, there are 2 billion interpretations of Islam. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and actually, I tell my students, I want you to be frustrated by the end of the semester because we like to simplify. We like to say, okay, well, Muslims, they believe this. Um, and the reality is that Muslims are very, very diverse, um, much like Christians are. And so you will find, I mean, first of all, of course, you have the big two Sunnis and Shi'is or Shi'as. But then you also have, by the way, other groups like Ibadis and others. But even within these groups, so much diversity. I mean, among the Shia or the Shi'is, you have uh, the Twelvers, the Seveners or Ismailis, the Zaydis. And within these groups, you have a lot of division. You have this, the, the Twelver Shi'is in Iran who believe in the authority of the supreme ruler of Iran uh, and others who disagree and they don't believe in the, and there, there's still 12 or Shi'is or Shi'as. Uh, you have the Sunnis, you have, you know, different schools of thought. Uh, there are four big ones. And then, and, but that pertains to law. In, the, in theology, you have at least three schools of thought, three big schools of thought. And then within these schools, so much diversity. And then, of course, you have modernist movements. And so there is an incredible amount of diversity among Muslims. And um, there are some things, though, that unite Muslims. For example, if I were to summarize what unites Muslims, belief in one God, one supreme being, uh, that's, I think, pretty safe to say. <laughs> um, the, the idea of worshiping God, um, the idea of giving to those in need, uh, that's a big thing that's stressed in the Qur'an, uh, a big theme in the Qur'an. Uh, and um, avoiding harming others, um, you know, not stealing, not murdering, not lying, not, um, you know, um, so, I mean, um, not harming those who are traveling and so on and so forth. So there are some things that unite Muslims generally um, but then once you get into the question, the, the details, uh, like what does it mean to pray? Uh, how often do you pray? Most Muslims who are practicing Muslims will say five times a day or five prayers a day. And then some will say nah, three pray three times, five prayers, but in three times of the day. And then some will say, no, three prayers a day. And some will say, no, two prayers a day or just one prayer. A day. Or maybe I don't have to pray this particular way as long as I'm kind of thinking of God. I mean, you might get some of that, but again, the majority will say probably five prayers a day. So, um, yeah, long story short, a lot of diversity. <laughs> I think that's important to note. I, I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, folks who are listening who come from a sort of a Christian background uh, full well know that within Christianity, we are constantly arguing about various details within our streams of thought. And that's been going on for, you know, generations and generations. Mm -hmm. So, um what are some and sometimes and sometimes these intra-religious uh, fights can be more intense than the inter-religious uh, disputes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. So uh, tell me, you know, talk about a little bit uh, more about uh, some some of the misconceptions that as you kind of dove into this new um, career to you know this this um, kind of journey of exploration and understanding. Yes. What are some of the other things that you discovered maybe that that uh, you weren't you know aware of before? Yeah. Well. So when I tell when I when I discuss uh, misconceptions, I usually mention violence and gender. Uh, yes. And when it comes to gender, uh, there are many, many, many misconceptions. And you know, again, I think we have to, the, the key thing to keep in mind is diversity. I think that's I think the number one thing to keep in mind. So um, when we think about, um, for example, dress how how does a Muslim dress? Well. <laughs> There are so many ways that Muslims dress. And um, I will say that most Muslims who are practicing Muslims do have a notion of modesty, that one should be modest in their dress, regardless of gender. Um, and so there is, there is a notion of modesty. Now, how does, what does that look like? Is it a woman wearing hijab, covering her hair and neck, usually? Um, is it a man wearing some kind of a cap on his head uh, or maybe a turban? Um, or, and then beyond that, I mean, I'm just talking about headgear here, but even just the rest of, you know, sometimes you'll see you can have um, you know, somebody in shorts and tank top or whatever, and then somebody's fully 
covered. Um, and uh, sometimes, so you, you, you'll see a lot of different things there. Um, and um, so um, dress is an area where we see a lot of um, diversity. Uh, there, but there are many other issues pertaining to gender. Um, for example, um, let's think about a, a marriage where you have a husband and a wife. And when we think about gender norms and rules, you know, there is um, this conception of, let's say, a man who works outside the home, comes home, and the woman is, the, the wife in this case, is cooking and preparing and cleaning and so on. You get these kinds of narratives. But when you actually go and look at Muslim majority countries, you see that this narrative is, is often not what's what's occurring, right? So in many cases, you'll have you'll have women who are working, uh, many cases, uh, high, in high positions. Um, in fact, I'll just mention here that there actually have been quite a few Muslim women heads of state, uh, while we still wait to see if America will have a woman head of state. Yes. So there, there have been numerous, and Bangladesh has had two. So, I mean, there, and Bangladesh is the country with the fourth largest Muslim population. Uh, in, in, you know, you just go down the list. I mean, actually, if you just type in, Mus- if you Google Muslim women heads of state, you'll see a really impressive list, actually. Um, so, and then you have, um, when it comes to the men or the husbands, and, and again, a kind of a sort of a traditional family model, um, the you will see often men who are doing, who are cooking and cleaning and so on. And in so doing, they're actually following the example of Muhammad. Because there is a well-known hadith that speaks of Muhammad cooking and sewing. And there's a what hadith or, or report that says that when he was at home, he only served his family. So, um, so these kinds of things are important because even if that's not common in some contexts, uh, it is common in others. And, and people will point to religious sources even to justify what they're doing um, in challenging maybe certain gender norms. So, so yeah, that's, that's another area. And, uh, you know, there's actually one more area, but I'll just pause here in case you had you know, any follow-up questions about gender. <laughs> no, I, I think that that was going to be my next one is, you know, there, there's this kind of uh, misconception, I think, that across the board. And, and of course, we like to simplify everything as human beings, you know, and, and boil things down, and, you know, that should be, that should allow for nuance. And yet we try to mm-hmm. simplify it and paint in broad brushstrokes. And so there's mm-hmm. this misnomer out there that, well, in Islam, women are, you know, they're, they're in a lowly position and, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think that's uh, fascinating yeah. that, you know, and again, I love that example because I've heard that before that, you know, we're still waiting on our mm-hmm. first female president. And right. yet, that's right. you know, <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, you know, you know, I, I want to be very clear here because I, you know, I, whenever I, whenever I, I, I do these interviews, I'm always imagining the skeptic in the audience. And so I, I have to clarify, yeah, there are, of course, you know, unfortunate examples where you, you have, for example, women who are uh, repressed. It's true. But the when you when you when you take a step back and you think about the population of Muslims is almost two billion, your example is very limited, right? But then there are so many counterexamples to that, and that's the point I always like to stress. And and I want my students to know that you know, I mean, even if we think about dress codes, okay, like uh, Iran it was all over the news for requiring the covering of the hair, right? Uh, and still, it requires this. But Iran is really one of only two, maybe three countries that has such a rule. I mean, Afghanistan is the other. Afghanistan actually even goes a step further now and as, as of recently has, is also requiring a, a kind of um, half face veil as well, which is unusual in the history of Afghanistan. But um, that's something that has happened. So these are really outliers, though. The vast majority, even Saudi Arabia right now, has no such dress code. Um and, and yet, many women choose to cover their hair nonetheless. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you right now, my own mother, coming out of Egypt, she was never required to cover her hair. In fact, her family, some members of her family, clearly looked down upon it. And yet she, and these were often male members of the family, and yet she, in spite of these men in her life, 
chose to to cover her hair. Um, so, you know, we just have to be careful with our assumptions. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, the lesson here. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, talk talk about some of the other uh, misconceptions that. Yeah, you've- well, well, the big one for the, the other big one I was going I was going to mention is just the rich history of Muslims right here in America. Um, you know, I think many people have this impression of Muslims being new to the country, and the fact of the matter is that Muslims have been here a long, long time. Actually, there were enslaved Africans, many of them who were Muslim. Uh, what percentage is up for debate, but certainly a significant number. And we, we have accounts, for example, there's a famous one of a scholar named Omar Ibn Sa'id. And we have his like autobiography. And, and he was somebody who was enslaved, brought to America, and um, lived here for a long time. And so we have many enslaved Africans who helped build this country. Um, we have, as you get into the 19th century, you begin to see many immigrants already coming to this country and also converts. Uh, there's one individual who's very interesting named Alexander Russell Webb, and he was from Missouri. And he was also, he, so he was a writer, a journalist, but he was also the American consul to the Philippines. And he converts to Islam and he actually um, has an audience, uh, a pretty, uh, you know, many people will listen to him, including Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain. And in his novel, Tom Sawyer Abroad, not to be confused with the original Tom Sawyer, but Tom Sawyer Abroad, he seems to make an inside joke with Webb by referring to Missouri Muslims or Muslims. Um, you know, because Webb was from Missouri. And so there's like a whole reference, there's a whole segment there on Missouri Muslims. So so you have Mark Twain um, making this reference. And then as we get into the, actually, I'll, I'll just even mention, back in the 1700s, even in the Revolutionary War, if you look at the names of people who fought alongside George Washington, you will see some Muslim names, like Bempet Muhammad. And Yusuf bin Ali. So even back in, during the period of the Revolutionary War, we see Muslims are fighting with George Washington. Um, and now it could be, I have to be careful here too. I mean, it could be that these were people who converted to Christianity. I don't know. But they had Muslim names at least. Um, then as we get into, so I mentioned the 19th century. As we get into the 20th century, we see all kinds of mosques being built 1921 Highland Park, Michigan, there's a mosque that's built. It doesn't last very long, but you have a mosque there. Cedar Rapids, Iowa, has what is sometimes called the Mother Mosque, uh, which was built in 1934. It's the oldest purpose-built mosque that is still in existence today. It's still used today. And it's in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We have other mosques we, we hear about in like Ross, North Dakota, and just places you wouldn't maybe expect. I, I didn't expect. And then um, we also see some prominent converts like Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, you know the song that's played at most American weddings probably, Celebration by Cool and the Gang? Yeah. Celebrate good times. Come on. That's So Cool is, is Muslim. Uh, he actually has a Muslim name even, Muhammad. And his brother... Ronald Bell, he also converted to Islam, has a Muslim name. He's the one who wrote the song. He, he, he began writing the song. And, and this is the thing that I just I find absolutely shocking. He, what got him thinking about the song was reading the, the Quran, reading the Islamic holy book. And by the way, if you don't believe me, I get it. I did not believe this at all <laughs> until I looked it up. And so I would encourage folks to go look up Celebration and look at the origin story of Celebration. Because Ronald Bell says he's reading a translation of the Quran, and there's a verse that talks about the angels celebrating Adam. And that's what got him, that's what led him to the line, everyone around the world, come on. And I'm a bad singer. And then, um, <laughs> but that's what got him thinking about it. And then what's interesting is, um, now, the song, of course, took another direction as, as he continued writing it. But I just find it so interesting that it began with him reading a translation of the Quran 
because that's the last thing I expected to be the source for that song. <laughs> I, you know, so just, just, so there's so much there that many people don't even realize. And the reason this is so important is that if you're not aware of that history, not you specifically, but if people are not aware of that history, then it's very easy to demonize Muslims. And I'll give you a great example. In 2017, at Rutgers University, I think in New Brunswick, the campus in New Brunswick and some other ca- college campuses, there was a poster developed by a white supremacist group called um, either America Vanguard or Vanguard America. And the poster, the message was, imagine a Muslim free America. And it had a picture of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And at first blush, it seems very compelling. Like, imagine no Muslims, we'd still have the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, everything would be great. But what's interesting is, I mean, obviously this demonstrates bigotry, but it also demonstrates profound ignorance. Ignorance because, first of all, it's ignoring the role that Muslims have played historically, whether the enslaved African Muslims or others. But it even demonstrates ignorance about the World Trade Center itself. I'm not going to tell you that it was a Muslim who actually designed the World Trade Center. It was not. It was not. It was. I will say it was a Japanese-American and I'll mention that because it was posted by a white supremacist group. <laughs> but 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 it was it was designed by a Japanese American. But I will say this: the design was based on or utilized something called tubed frame design. And who, pray tell, came up with tubed frame design? A Muslim named Fazlur Rahman Khan, who was originally from Bangladesh. He came to the U.S., studied at the University of Illinois, uh, became known as the Einstein of structural engineering. And in addition to coming up with tubed frame design, he did actually design the Sears Tower or the Will or Willis Tower, which was the tallest building in the world for a while, uh, and also the John Hancock Center. And for people performing the pilgrimage to Mecca, he designed the Hajj terminal at the Jeddah airport. So pretty Muslimy. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, so you know, imagine these people who came up with this poster. I, obviously, they had no idea about any of this, but I also think it's important to, I mean, to reflect and, and think about this. I think if these people who made the poster had had meaningful interactions with Muslims. Meaningful interactions, not just you see somebody you talk, but a meaningful interaction. They, I, they would definitely not be doing this. They would definitely not be doing this because when you have meaningful interactions with people, it's very easy to see how similar we are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're very similar, and and this is something I can appreciate as someone who was raised as a Muslim with most of my classmates being Christian and, and, and other, you know, and other things. Um, it's easy for me to appreciate that, but maybe it's not easy for others to appreciate that. And that's why I think it's, it's important to just have meaningful interactions with people to see our shared humanity. Um, because we, yeah, we really are more similar than, than we are different. Even though the fall can feel jam packed, HelloFresh makes whipping up a home cooked dinner actually doable with quick and easy options, including their 15-minute meals. That's less time than it takes to get delivery. And with everything pre-portioned and delivered right to your door every week, it really is a no-brainer. Turn to HelloFresh Market for yummy add-ons and enjoy the season's limited-time fall flavors lineup. Feast on desserts like the apple cider cake with caramel sauce, or please a crowd with appetizers like the barbecue pulled pork nachos. And don't forget the mini pumpkin cheesecake. Perfect for a me-time treat. My daughter and I have been getting HelloFresh for over a year now, and I love how much time it saves me as a single dad. We actually also recently added the pumpkin cheesecakes, and they were amazing. So go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Deconstruct and use code 50Deconstruct for 50% off plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Deconstruct and use code 50Deconstruct for 50% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh. America's number one meal kit. 
Yeah, I, I could not agree more. And I, I've said something similar in the past. You know, I, I was I was having a conversation with um, someone I went to high school with, and it wasn't somebody I was particularly close with, but we happened to, you know, you end up Facebook friends somehow, some way. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were having a conversation, and he had posted something I, I was irritated about, you know. And uh, I typically don't get into Facebook arguments. But in this instance, I had just uh, finished up a, a graduate school class on world religions, and I had a, a little bit more of a, a base knowledge, I, I'd like to think, of of Islam. And he was posting something that was just blatantly wrong. And mm-hmm. I called him out on it. And we got into this debate on Facebook, and finally I... I I said, it, re- regardless of the points that we're debating here, I said, at the very end of the day, ultimately, you know, I, he, he lives, still lives in the small town I grew up in, surrounded by the same type of people who think the same things, look the same way, and do the same things, you know? And I said, I moved. I moved to a larger city. I surrounded myself with people who don't think like me, don't look like me, um, and I got to know them, and I became friends with them, and I love them. And I can't afford to hold that same worldview that maybe I once did. I'd like to think I never did. But, but point being that you're right. I got to know people who weren't like me and realized that you know, we have a ton of common ground. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I, I'm, just, I'm not interested in you know, holding that worldview anymore. You know, I, they're, mm-hmm. they're my friends, and that's all that matters. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that whole topic is what really led to my dissertation and my first book. Um, my first book is called Islam and the Fate of Others. Mm. And what I'm doing in that book is I'm looking at how Muslims, scholars, have, his, have, his, have historically um, grappled with the question of non-Muslims, the fate of non-Muslims in the afterlife. And for me, this was always um, a very troubling issue because I would hear one thing from some teachers. I would hear, oh, well, yeah, all non-Muslims go to hell. And I would be like, man, I, I mean, Tim seems like a good guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, I, and then in contrast, you got Muhammad over here who's doing all kinds of, you know, non- nonsense. That's that guy's going to heaven and this guy's going to hell. Um, so that was something that I, that I really grappled with and struggled with. And so that was, um, and that was also played into the 9-11 discourse too, right? This, this idea that Muslims, they look down on non-Muslims, and so that's what made it so easy to kill so many non-Muslims on 9-11. Never mind the fact that many Muslims were actually killed too, innocent Muslims uh, who just happened to be working there. But in any case, um, so, so I, I began to explore and look, at, look into this question, and I was surprised to see some of the most famous theologians in the history of Islam speaking of the possibility of non-Muslims going to heaven. And I was just shocked because I I was like, really, that scholar said this? That was not what I expected at all. I was expecting the the exact opposite based on what what I was taught. Um, So um, so that's, that's something that goes back to this issue that this idea that we're so similar that, and, 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 you know, if you're born into a particular religious tradition, there's a pretty good chance you're going to continue being in that religious tradition. Um, if you are, if you are going, going to continue practicing religion, that you're going to continue in that same tradition, there's a pretty good chance. Of course, it's not absolute, but it's a, there's a good chance. So how could it be that God in God's justice and mercy and love would just send everyone else to hell forever. That was something that was always uh, a challenge, to, uh, and, and so that's what led me to my to spend six years on that project, on that book, um, just to kind of think through some of these things. Yeah, that's that's remarkable, um, and we see similar again. We see similar studies in uh, Christianity, and um, you know, uh, multiple different um, scholars sort of trying to wrestle with well. Is there a way in which non-Christians can also get into heaven? So uh, talk a little bit about that, though, because I think that's probably some people's ears probably perked up um, in, in terms of heaven and hell in the afterlife. So what, what are sort of the beliefs yes. uh, within Islam in terms of what that looks like? Yeah, so, well, there's a prevailing belief in heaven and, and hell. That is the prevailing belief. And, and also um, prior to that, a period of judgment um, where, where one's uh, faith and deeds are all considered and, and measured, so to speak. Um, 
And and I want to be careful here because I think some people have a misconception that Muslims are going around counting their deeds um, as if that's how, how they, they get into heaven. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is that it, it's more complicated than that. Uh, basically, what one needs to uh, reach heaven is to have faith and to do good. And But still, you know, things are... It ultimately comes down to what kind of person are you becoming? That's maybe the most important thing. And and one there are reports where Muhammad, the prophet, peace be upon him, he's quoted as depicting scenes of sinners who, you know, their whole lives, they're sinners. But at the end of their lives, they see like a starving dog, uh, a thirsty, starving dog. And so they, they provide water to the dog and then they pass away. And then they go to heaven, actually, because they ended on in a state where they they had reached a higher state in the end. Um, so it wasn't about weighing their deeds; it was about really more about what kind of person are you becoming in the end. Hmm. Um, and then, in, in contrast, there's a report of someone who was always good, always praying, but then in the end of that person's life, they tortured an animal, and then um, so clearly they had reached a low state right at the end. And then they're punished for it in hell. But the concept of hell is, is complicated in Islam uh, because one could spend some time in hell and then leave hell and go to heaven. So hell is not, it, it's, it's not necessarily always permanent uh, or, or everlasting. Um, so this is now where we, we get into one of the controversial issues that I discuss in my book. Um, because there's, there's a, the prevailing view, the, the majority of Muslims believe that many people will go to hell, but they'll leave hell and go to heaven. Hmm. But, who, but some people will remain in hell forever. That's, if, if, like, if you were to do a poll, that's probably what the majority of Muslims would say. That there are some people who will remain in hell forever, for the rest of time. But here's what's interesting. I, in doing the research for my book... I found one of the most influential, shall we say, conservative scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah of the 14th century, who in, in, in the last thing he writes before his pen is confiscated, he was imprisoned. <laughs> um, he, the last thing he writes is a treatise in which he argues that one day every single person will leave hell and go to heaven. So hell functions more as a kind of purgatory then. And this is a, a, a traditionalist scholar who, you know, likes to ground all his opinions on early reports of early Muslims and so on. And so it was, to my mind, it was remarkable that this scholar of all people, Ibn, his name is Ibn Taymiyyah, that he would be saying this. Hmm. Um, and, and what's interesting is that today, Ibn Taymiyyah's books are really popular in, in countries like Saudi Arabia. And, but what's interesting is, is that you'll have people now denying that he ever said this. But these are all modern denials. Nobody back then denied it. And actually, his own student, another famous traditionalist scholar named Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah would, would quote it and expand on it in three works. And even has a statement like, to paraphrase, that if you if the light of God shines upon you, you'll see that this makes sense. And that's shocking because these are scholars who have a reputation of being pretty conservative and traditionalist. So, uh, so that was one of the eye-opening discoveries for me. And I remember I presented this at a conference in Jordan in 2005. And immediately afterwards, a Christian woman came up to me and said that, her priest had told, told her the same thing, but that it was supposed to be a, supposed to be a secret. Like you're not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yes. That's so, so yeah, so, so that's one of the interesting things. And then the other interesting thing is, okay, well, what about non-Muslims, right? Like, mm. so somebody doesn't believe in Muhammad as a prophet. What happens to that person? And, you know, the same scholar I just mentioned, Ibn Taymiyyah, he would be kind of strict in this area. He would say, well, if somebody received the revelation, they heard about Muhammad and then they didn't like study and look into it. Well, then, yeah, they they would be going to hell, according to Ibn Taymiyyah, the same scholar who has this view of everybody leaving hell. 
But then when you look at other scholars, um, for example, there's a scholar named Al-Ghazali, maybe the most influential theologian in the history of Islam. Al-Ghazali, he dies in 1111. So easy to remember. 1111 <laughs> of the Common Era. Al-Ghazali says that there are different categories of non-Muslims. So he, he, dis, he makes distinctions. And he says, actually, most non-Muslims will go to heaven. Uh, but the ones that will go to hell are the ones who heard about Muhammad and then rejected him, completely rejected him or ignored him. But if they at least investigate, maybe they don't convert, but they investigate sincerely and then death overtakes them, then they would also be excused, according to Al-Ghazali. <coughs> Excuse me. Then you have others. I'll mention one more example. Uh, you have Ibn Arabi, Ibn al-Arabi, a famous Sufi thinker. And Ibn Arabi says that it really just comes down to, do you see Muhammad as a prophet or not? That's for him the key criterion. So if one does not see Muhammad as a prophet, since like sincerely, then they're not to be culpable. They're not culpable for that. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, that's the range of views. That's fascinating. Um, one of the things <coughs> I, I want to make sure that we, we cover it today is, because um, we haven't really talked about it before, it's just uh, the idea of, of major holidays within religions, and obviously Christianity, the big two, Christian or Christmas and Easter. Um, so what are sort of the, uh, uh, the Islamic kind of equivalents, uh, you know, if you, if you could? Oh, I think your microphone's off. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. How about now? Yeah, there we go. Good. Yeah, I went on. I began coughing <laughs> so uncontrollably. Anyway, so Islam also has two big ones. The first one is called Eid al Fitr. Eid al Fitr, which means the festival of breaking the fast. And this is at the. This is after a month of fasting in the month of Ramadan. So Ramadan is a month in the Islamic calendar. Uh, it's it actually is um, completely detached from the solar calendar. So Ramadan this year was in you know mid March to mid April roughly, or late March to late April. Next year, early March to early April, somewhere you know it shifts about eleven days every year. So um, after Ramadan, there is this big holiday called Eid al Fitr, and this is a huge uh, you know. A holiday where people will, first of all, they'll actually get to eat and drink during the day. That's huge. <laughs> <laughs> because in Ramadan, Muslims abstain from eating and drinking. Uh, those who are able to, I should say. If you're able to, you abstain from eating and drinking during the day. And the purpose is to attain uh, God consciousness, to be thinking about God. So, after this month, there's this big uh, holiday. People will usually, if they're practicing Muslims, even if they're not so practicing, they'll go to a huge Eid service, prayer service. And sometimes they'll hold it outside of a mosque, maybe in some big venue. For example, here in, in Lansing, they hold it at the Lansing Center, not the mosque. And, and you'll have thousands of people, people maybe you never, you've never seen before. They, you see them now at this, at this event. And uh, the other major holiday is Eid al-Adha, Eid al-Adha, which is the festival of the sacrifice. And this overlaps, it, it takes place about two months and nine to ten days after that first festival I just mentioned, Eid al-Fitr. So Eid al-Adha, they both have the word Eid in, it, in them, by the way. Eid just means festival or holiday. So you have now Eid al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice. This occurs in the 12th month uh, on day 10. And this overlaps with the pilgrimage to Mecca. So during this time, you have people performing the once in a lifetime, if, if they're able to, pilgrimage to Mecca. And the pilgrimage, you know, if you go any time of the year, it's like a lesser pilgrimage. But if you go at, during this time of the year, that's the greater pilgrimage. That's the Hajj. Uh, that's what's expected of, of all able-bodied uh, Muslims who can afford it um, at least once in their lifetime. And because only maybe, what, three million people go 
out of 2 billion. So most Muslims in their lifetime will probably not get a chance to do the Hajj, actually. But for those who do go, it's often a transformative experience. Not always, but for many, certainly it was for me, certainly it was for my wife. Transformative experience. Uh, and um, so that overlaps with this festival. And, and the festival of sacrifice, why is it called sacrifice? Well, it uh, alludes to the, the biblical narrative of Abraham and the sacrifice of his own son, this very disturbing <laughs> moment where he's told, where he's commanded to sacrifice his own son. Now, in the Islamic narrative, the Islamic version, the, the Quran never explicitly says which son is to be sacrificed. Many assume it's Ishmael, because later in the same chapter, there's reference to Isaac. Uh, in a way that makes you think, oh, this is a different son. But it's never explicit. So actually, there were some early Muslims who thought it was Isaac, just as in the Bible. In any case, in the Quranic version, Abraham has a vision, most say a dream, that he is to sacrifice his own son. He goes to his son and he asks him, hey, look, I had this vision. What do you think? And his son says, well, if that's what... God is commanding you, then I, I submit. So this is an interesting um, aspect of the narrative. <coughs> and, and of course, in the end, the son is not sacrificed. <coughs> Excuse me. And instead, um, you know, you have some kind of animal sacrifice instead. Um, so that's something that we'll see during this period as well. Oh, that's that's really neat. And, and, and again, one of those little references that uh, where we have this sort of um, uh, intersection between, you know, Islam and, and Christianity. I think that's really neat. Um, yeah. And actually, if I may add yeah. one thing I forgot to mention during the pilgrimage, there are all kinds of things that one does that allude to reports about Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael. Um, in fact, after, so the, the whole the, the Kaaba in Mecca, the whole, that, that sanctuary, that cubic structure in Mecca, it's usually covered with some kind of black cloth. Although, by the way, historically the color changed over time. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. You okay? <laughs> of course, now I now suddenly I have to cough when I'm doing an interview. <laughs> um, so, but it's interesting is that there's this general belief that this site was devoted by Abraham and Ishmael, uh, that there was some kind of um, holy site established there. Not that the Kaaba we see today was originally built by Abraham and Ishmael, but that there was something there. And so, so that's, that, that reminds us of Abraham and Ishmael. And then after one goes around the Kaaba seven times as part of the rituals of the pilgrimage, one also go, kind of walks quickly between two mountains or small or hills, we'll say, called Safa and Marwa. And in doing this, one is recalling Hagar running between two hills, desperate for water for her son Ishmael. Uh, and so and you go down the list of rituals, you see, oh, this refers to something Abraham did or Ishmael did or Hagar did. Of course, these are things that are not found in the Bible necessarily. Maybe some aspects, but not the whole narrative. Not, not the from the Muslim perspective, the whole narrative. Of course, from the Christian perspective, these would be you know you know additions to the narrative. So, but uh, but yeah, that's so that so that's another interesting thing is that you know you're you're thinking about Abraham, Hagar, and Ishmael during the the pilgrimage. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, th this was a really interesting conversation. I, and I know we're running uh, uh, short on time, but uh, if you could leave folks with. Um, uh, I think it'd be kind of neat to uh, tell us what what are some of your favorite verses uh, that you find beauty mm. and inspiration in in the Quran. I think that would be a cool way to end. Yes, well, there's a verse I want to say in Surah 49, the 49th surah or chapter, but it says that God made us into races and tribes, so that you may come to know one another, so that you may come to know one another. Like God made us have this diversity so that you may come to know one another, um, so that we learn from one another, we, we, we exchange information, we 
And I, I just think that's a very beautiful idea. Oh, man, I love that. That's that's a perfect way to end. Thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. And I, I know the listeners are going to love it. Um, you know, I just appreciate you uh, taking some time out of your day to spend with us. It was my pleasure. Thank you for, for a great interview. I appreciate it. Does he have a body or even a name? If he does, does he know that I'm alive? Oh